get this out of the way. Okay, so we're gonna, in this session, we're gonna talk about things you do before the class starts, things that you can do while you're building your courses, many of us are for the spring semester to make your classes a little bit more inclusive. Um, and one of the first things is welcoming syllabus. And this is a term that was first used by, um, by um, what the best teachers do, Ken Bain, in a book, well, in, in first an essay, and then a, a couple of editions of his book and a couple of his books. And so basically one of the main issues is you want your syllabus to be something in making students feel welcome in the class, mm -hmm. if you'd like to. Sure, yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of um, faculty have kind of traditionally thought about the syllabus as this legal contract between, um, you know, faculty and, and their students. Um, and really what we want to, you know, kind of flip on its head, it's, it's creating something that is inviting to students, that is uh, collaborative with students, something that is um, creating a course that is both as much theirs and, and ours as well. And Ken Brand breaks us up into a number of things which are tied to what we know about teaching and learning in terms of what things encourage long-term learning and student engagement. Uh, and one of the first ones is when you think about your course, think about the things that got you interested in the discipline. You know, after you've been doing this for a while, while you're in grad school, you think about some fairly narrow topics, but those are not generally the things that got you interested in the discipline in the first place. So think about the big questions that your class is asked that might be of interest to students, that might engage them, and you might be able to design your whole class around one of those big questions or a few big questions and use those to help provoke curiosity at the the start of the course and in the syllabus. Um, and explaining how, you know, each of the activities that you are engaging in in the course is necessary to answer those big questions. So, you know, make, make it very clear to students why you're doing uh, certain, why, why you're spending um, the time that you are allocating to various assessments or activities, um, because getting, getting students to, I mean, you, you can certainly throw in a bunch of activities towards students and they will, you know, accept that, I'm sure, maybe, but, you know, getting them to kind of buy into why it's important and how it connects to those big questions um, is really good to help them. And remind yeah. students that in order to be able to achieve the goals, these are the skills and the concepts that you have to be able to master to get to that point, to help motivate it so that students understand what you're doing and why and how it's all connected to giving them these new skills. Mm -hmm. So creating, you know, student-centered course policies. So thinking about, you know, the students' perspective and how, you know, each, um, uh, you know, uh, each policy that you're writing can be um, purposeful and intentional and in including them and um, thinking about the kind of resources they might need to be successful in the course. And including statements about, you know, about your views on diversity and so forth are important, making sure that you want students to be uh, the focus of the class and it's trying to be designed to serve their needs and that you'll be asking them for feedback as you go through. Um, one of the worst things that I keep hearing from people at workshops is faculty will say, well, I do that on syllabus day. And then last year we heard someone say, well, during syllabus week, and I just couldn't imagine spending more than a few minutes on a syllabus in class, but certainly not a week on the syllabus. We, you know, we only have 14 weeks in the semester. And you know, one of the worst things that many of us do, and I used to do it regularly myself, is to spend the first day going through the syllabus, especially if it's a syllabus that looks like a legal document with all these thou shalt not type things. Use that first day of class to engage the students, to talk about the questions that they're going to be addressing. Those first few minutes of a class, and certainly the first day, have a lot of influence on student perceptions of the class. So do something in that class that will show them what they'll be doing, run through some activities or some examples of activities you're going to do on that first day. And you may ask them to read the syllabus. You may go back to the syllabus on the next class day and go through it in a bit more detail, but don't use the first day to focus just on the syllabus and certainly don't spend a week going over this. Line by line, you know, talking about the syllabus, 
um, isn't super productive. And you know, if you have your syllabus done well in advance, it's always a good thing to send it out to students in advance. Um, talk to them about how excited you are about them coming in on the first day. Um, and you know, just don't need to do the line by line. <laughs> Um, we already mentioned those. Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess that leads right into uh, this uh, slide here. So, you know, uh, sharing a welcome video, you know, uh, really talking to your students about how excited you are, sharing whatever supplemental documents that you are, um, that you want to share with them, like the course syllabus, the course schedule, or, um, you know, giving them a heads up on readings that you might cover in that first week, um, but to really create that um, that motivating and welcoming environment right off the bat. And also, if you do use an announcement, oh, video is a really impressive way of doing it, and it can really give a nice positive introduction to the course, and it can relieve apprehension, so students feel a little bit more comfortable when they start the class. But if you're going to use announcements to do the same thing, and that's fine, that's probably what more people tend to do, um, use a replace strings, personalize it, have their name appear at the top or within the document itself. It's a really useful way of, we got back that tool when we moved to Brightspace. We used to have it in Angel, we lost it when we moved to Blackboard. And just that little personal touch can help create a more positive environment. And you can embed those videos in the announcements too. So there's, there's really a lot of opportunities there. Um, and humanizing yourself is also another important aspect of, of creating that welcoming environment. You know, we talked about thinking about what motivated us to join the discipline, sharing that information and being open with your students about, um, you know, your passions, you know, related to the course content, you know, really can help get them excited about the course content too and, um, you know, make them feel like, you know, they're, um, you know, able to ask questions and kind of dive in, you know, as uh, deeply as they they like. Yeah. Um, another thing you can do with announcements and with messaging is promote a growth mindset and do this both in the syllabus and in initial communications and regularly throughout the class. Just clearly and communicate that you believe that all the students have the ability to be successful in the course, that the course is designed to be challenging. It's probably better to use the word challenging than rigorous because rigorous have, has all these negative connotations associated with it, but challenge is good, challenge is positive. Um, you know, highlighting that mistakes are an essential part of learning. So, you know, providing examples of your own experience is also another way to humanize yourself uh, within that class. Um, and, you know, really assuring students that you're gonna give them the resources, the opportunities and time to be successful in the class. And we all know from our own experiences that when we were doing research, when we were doing our part of adding to the, the literature of the discipline, some of the things we did just didn't work. But students will often see the course as this fixed body of knowledge they somehow have to master. But reminding them that learning requires making mistakes along the way and that you learn from those mistakes. And that when they're doing it, you'll be giving them feedback to help them be successful as they move through the course. And feedback is essential for learning. And, you know, like I said before, that you're that you are there as a resource and to help connect them to the resources that are going to support them in their learning. So another important, you know, aspect of designing an inclusive course is keeping the uh, costs associated with the course as low as possible. So, you know, it's um, I'm sure, you know, there's lots of um, open education resources for various disciplines that are worth, um, you know, checking out. Um, but, you know, even if you are um, requiring, you know, a textbook, thinking about finding something that is not, um, you know, going to uh, be a financial hardship on students. I know for my classes, I've made a commitment to, to keep my course costs uh, zero um, for my students. And so, you know, it's, it's a little more work to allocate or to aggregate all of those materials, but, um, it's definitely something my students have mentioned to me as being, you know, an important aspect of the class. 
there's only one course that any of my, that I teach that any of my students have to pay for something. And because it's inclusive access, they pay a reduced price and they all get access to it on day one. If you have to charge ridiculous prices for your material, see if it can be done electronically with, um, with inclusive access, as we call it here. So that way, students will have it added to the bill as a fee. It, it comes through financial aid a bit more directly. And because one of the main problems is that students who struggle with, with financial issues will often avoid buying a textbook or will delay it as long as possible. And often by the time they get access to the text, it's too late. So however you do it, make sure that all students have equal access to the course materials. And so that the students who often come with disadvantaged backgrounds are not further disadvantaged. Yeah. And a lot of those vouchers for textbooks are um, you know, delayed for students um, who are receiving that kind of financial aid. And so it's not as if they always want to be delayed in, in getting those materials, but they just don't have the, the, the uh, financial aid just hasn't come through right on first day of class. So um, again, that's where inclusive access can really uh, alleviate that burden. Keeping course copies of your uh, materials at the library um, desk, you know, is another way you can work on um, providing that information. But if you're teaching large classes, that's not yeah, terribly it's, useful. And yeah, it's, it's, and students. you want everyone to have access all the time. The library is only open periodically, you know, and it may not be when students need to be able to work or it may not be convenient. So try to keep the materials as available as possible. Um, one thing you can try to do is decolonize your syllabus, try to make sure that you include diverse authors so that students may see themselves represented in the readings to the extent possible. Um, you know, using diverse examples um, in your um, course content as well, um, making sure that you're not systematically excluding um, groups of people in your discipline. So I know in criminal justice, um, you know, there's very little discussion in textbooks on um, indigenous folk mm -hmm. and, um, you know, various underrepresented groups, um, such as um, the transgender community. And so making sure that you are balancing out, you know, the kinds of uh, textbooks that you're using with those perspectives and those voices are incredibly important. And if there really are no appropriate readings from diverse voices, recognize that and explicitly acknowledge that this has been an issue in your discipline in the past that your discipline is working on. Because pretty much all disciplines are working on this, but acknowledging the excluding the exclusion of voices in the past can help remedy the, the lack of those voices in some of the readings, for example. Mm -hmm. That was actually a suggestion that came from a student at a Cornell MOOC who had their professor do it and found it really useful, the Cornell Inclusive Teaching MOOC. Um, you know, explicitly recognizing diversity as an asset for the class. So, you know, creating a diversity statement in your um, syllabus, setting expectations around uh, discussions and valuing those uh, diverse viewpoints are also uh, vital to creating that or designing that inclusive course. And not only saying that, but actually getting students to make their own connection. So asking students to try to connect the course materials to their own life experiences, their own lived experiences, is a really good way of not just going through the, the lip service of valuing diverse viewpoints, but actually getting students to bring their own voices there and sharing those in some ways with the class. Um, making sure that you're using inclusive language. And so, um, you know, if you are comfortable sharing your own pronouns and make it clear that you are, um, you know, comfortable with, um, you know, students sharing, um, you know, theirs, if, if that is what they are comfortable with, um, creating that tone in, in your course documents um, is um, really important to uh, making sure every student feels like they belong. And, have that opportunity. Although there is some suggestion that 
it's good for you to share your pronouns and to let students do that and encourage them to do that if they're comfortable. Sometimes students do not want to do that. So don't require that they share their pronouns because that can actually backfire for people who don't feel comfortable for whatever reason in doing that. Or still figuring it out. Or still working on that, yes. So, you know, at the very start of class, um, you know, there's lots of ways you can, you know, really get to know your students. Um, so using a survey or a Google forum, um, the idea of a who's in class forum, um, which I think was uh, quite Tracy Addy actually from Lafayette College developed that and they've been using it a lot and many people in many campuses have been using it for the last couple of years. It's available online, you can download it and it's, it's a nice way of getting some information about who is in your class. Mm -hmm. It allows students to, you know, provide that information, um, not necessarily open in front of their classmates, but something that's, you know, between you and your students gives them a sense of, um, you know, being able to share what they are comfortable with in that moment. And you could do that either as an anonymous form where you don't get to see it, so you can get at least some information about um, the composition of your class, or it could be just something that you receive. You might also want though them to share in some type of a, a law in some type of a discussion forum, um, things that they want their classmates to know. So both options are good, but you do want to um, at least provide, you want to know your students, but you want them to get to know each other and finding a way to do that can be really useful. Learning students' names, right? So even if you are in a big class using something like a table tent, um, which, you know, is just a piece of paper folded over with their names clearly written on, um, on and calling students by their names uh, can really um, create that sense of belonging and that sense of connection in the classroom. And we do have a workshop coming up. I think Kristen is one of the people presenting on learning students' pronouns and so forth. Um, sometime on the schedule, I don't know what the schedule looks like exactly. Um, also learning name pronunciations, mm -hmm. you know, and um, a simple way of doing it, especially if it's a larger class, is to have students share audio clips, either in a form or using Flipgrid or something similar. So you can go back and refer to that in case you forget. Um, providing students with multiple means of representation, so various ways of acquiring knowledge, so keeping your course content varied um, and accessible in, um, in multiple formats. And that could include videos, it could be text, it could be blogs, it could be podcasts. There's many different ways of connecting to material and giving students more ways to connect is useful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really um, asking students what their interests are, you know, to really try to keep that engagement with the course material um, in, in their motivation uh, at the forefront is um, vital. And also offering challenge, but you have to be careful with the challenge. If it's too much, students will get lost. If it's too little, students will get bored. And we have classes with students with very diverse backgrounds, and we have to find a way of keeping all students challenged but not discouraged. And, and that can be difficult. And these are the three UDL principles, multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression. And the last one? And the last one, you know, providing students with alternate ways of demonstrating knowledge. So, you know, whether, um, you know, they want to present the culmination of their research in a podcast or a video presentation or presenting in front of a group or uh, writing a paper, you know, giving students the flexibility to choose um, the format of the way they demonstrate their understanding of the course material is, um, you know, quite inclusive and allows them to um, An essay projects could, for, as the one Maggie talked as the ones Maggie talked about a couple of days ago could be really good. I had some students in the class at Duke do an interpretive dance illustrating some of the things they had learned. So there's many ways in which you can do it. It could be yeah. infographics and so on. And students make board games, um, you know, make um, podcasts. Um, some wrote a play, you know, short stories. It was really a cool experience. And that's all we have, but we, we've got a little bit of time, not really a lot, but we, we, we cheat on a this little a little bit, bit more than other people do. <laughs>
So, or suggestions on things that you've yeah. done that have been helpful in terms of how you design the class. The next session we're going to talk about is how you operate the class in an inclusive manner. We figure we break it up a little bit this way. Any thoughts or suggestions, either in chat or um, or just oh, turn your microphones on. John, can you explain how to customize announcements to each student? Oh, you use a replace string and um, basically you put the last name in between dollar signs with first name, um, a dollar sign, first name, underscore, last name. Is that it? I think it's all together. It's all, yeah. We, oh, we can send that out. We can send that out. Yeah, but yeah, there's, there's um, some, we've done several workshops on that um, uh, last spring and, and this fall, fall. But yeah, but, um, yeah it's. It's one of the things I just look at in my old ones and copy and paste in. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I think you're right. I think it is first name, last name with the F and the L capitalized, if I remember. Yeah. And yeah, in square brackets, right? Or was it a curly braces? Curly braces, yeah. But if you search for replace strings, right space replace strings, you'll see examples you can copy and paste that. And you can do that in anything except for headers for documents. You can do it right in, in your pages. You can do it in email. You can do it in announcements. Mm -hmm. And it's just have a you nice found, touch. Oh, sorry. Have you found a workaround when the Brightspace still has the student's dead name? And so you want to personalize it for you know everyone, but there's that one student who, for whatever reason, hasn't you know gotten that changed students can update that in on the campus there was a problem though in that the names i had in brightspace did not match the names in banner and i'm not sure which ones were being updated last semester and it caused a major problem in uploading grades it wasn't so much dead names as that i had a student who was named uh john with the same present of this but who went by jack jack in brightspace john in um in by in right uh, john in the um in banner and there were four people with the same last names and i had to rearrange the order in order to upload grades every week but but that should be resolved now so what should happen is students can fill out a form and it will replace the name in banner and it should replace it in brightspace as well so that way it will reflect whatever names the students are using great and it that's should. through register registrar where they it's actually a cts website it may be on the registrar's page i'm not sure changing. does anyone know offhand um i, I would have to look into that to see contacting it? help at oswego if a student contacts help at oswego that they would get instructions from that gotcha thank you but I, I don't remember offhand it's somewhere on the college website there is a place where you can do that but i don't remember where there is yeah, I've seen that page and I can't think of what the title of the page is called. And it was a question about getting the presentation. Yeah, I'd be happy to share it. I can actually put a link to it in chat. Uh, let me just do that right now. Um, let me grab the link and then. Um, Kristen put the, 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 the page. Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. And let me, and I will drop. Excellent. Oh, it's over here. Um, and here is the, the slides for that. But we will also, we've recorded this and it will be posted probably by this afternoon. First couple of sessions are already posted today. Any other thoughts or reactions or suggestions? Okay, well, it's good seeing everyone. Yeah. Um, Oh, okay. SUNY and us are changing preferred name to chosen name, which is, yeah, which makes sense because it's a name the students choose. It's not an issue of preference if they are moving to a new name. Yeah. Excellent. That's a more inclusive practice. Okay. We're going to stop the session so we can exit and get the video rendered. And then uh, we'll be right back. If any of you are interested in sticking around. Classroom environment.